They say adventure begins once all your plans start to go to hell. Well, that's exactly what happened to me in the Indian Ocean as I made my way into three months out at sea. I'm Jerome Rand and your host here for Sailing Stories uh, aboard the old Mighty Sparrow. And today we get into the third part of my Sailing into Oblivion series, which is the Indian Ocean, that vast, untamed, vicious ocean in between South Africa and Australia. So I had crossed underneath the Cape of Good Hope uh, officially on December 13th, and now I was trying to make my way as far away from that Cape as possible. It's really pretty scary down there, mostly because it takes so long to get clear of the Cape of Good Hope and the Agullis Current and the dangers <clears throat> that lie in that place. And when you're going underneath these capes, Part of the problem is if you get a massive weather system that comes from the west and goes towards the east, you can't really go far north to get at least riding the northern edge and getting the westerlies. You pretty much sort of just have to grin and bear it. And the Indian Ocean, as far as I knew and as far as I read in some of the old books, it, it basically was just a violent sort of place. The storms were seemingly more aggressive and they came off of Antarctica really quickly these these big old low pressure systems so I was already on like heightened awareness at this point and I wanted to uh, pretty much get past the Cape and then try and head a little further north you know just north of the sort of 40 degree barrier of the Southern Ocean that's what Mortissier had done, and I sort of figured, well, I'll try that. Maybe I'll get some calmer conditions. And after after going through the first big, big storm, I ended up uh, sort of working on different ways to deal with the heavy weather and the wind and what was working with Sparrow and what wasn't. And I had my opportunity, it seemed like, every few days to every week, some other system would come in and I'd get blown around like crazy. And so I was sort of coming into my own as far as the heavy weather stuff came, but it was shocking. There were the forecasts that I was receiving really didn't add up to what was happening in real life down there. And obviously they don't have the weather buoys and all that that uh, help really define your, your forecast like you get in the Atlantic, but so be it. I was down there and at least most of the weather was coming from the West. And so I was riding with it. Now, approximately 600 miles or so into the Indian Ocean, well beyond the point of return to get back to Africa, I ended up uh, sort of taking note that my water supply was really starting to dwindle more and more. Now, in the South Atlantic, it barely rained, and when it did, it was usually blowing so hard that salt water was getting sprayed into the sails, and so collecting it was, was really just not happening. And so I, I was already kind of rationing down and eating mostly canned food and things that don't take water to actually uh, make them like the dehydrated stuff. And so I was already conserving and it had been a very long time. I hate to admit how long, but it had been a long time since I had taken any semblance of a shower or bath. Um, and by that, essentially, I mean a half a gallon of water in a jug and you dump it over your head. But so I wasn't really doing that, and uh, I was having trouble, too, because I was finding that instead of this, these systems and storms coming through and then the winds calming down a bit and you keep sailing, it was like a system would come through and then there wouldn't be any wind at all. And I would sit there and I would have to wait until the next storm or system came in, which is terribly frustrating, and it's slow. You're almost inchworming you know, your way around, but... I eventually got down so low on the water, below 20 gallons, that uh, I pulled the emergency pump out. And this is just a hand hand use pump um, that desalinates the, the ocean water and turns it into fresh water. And usually these are used in uh, life rafts, but I, I had one because it was cost effective and I figured, you know, I was going to be trying to catch rain anyway. So this produces one gallon of fresh water per hour when you pump it. 
and it was working pretty well and things were going okay. And then about two weeks into the Indian Ocean, uh, I sat down, I had about a four hour session of just sitting there and pumping and you have to pump a certain speed. If you go too fast, it doesn't produce more, it doesn't produce any. And if you go too slow, it doesn't produce any as well. So it's one pump per second, essentially. And after about a four hour session, sitting there getting down to the last because i wanted to do five gallons that day and crack all of a sudden it just i look down and i know i'm in absolute trouble now the casing that holds this whole thing together because the pressures involved with making fresh water out of salt water are pretty pretty high it had exploded and it's a plastic casing and i'm just looking at this thing and it was as if all the blood came right out of my head and drained and I just sort of sat there for a second and there wasn't a whole lot that I could do at that moment and I knew okay my first instinct was to just grab the thing and chuck it overboard in anger but obviously calmer heads prevailed and I went about attempting some fixes now I sat and thought for a long time before I attempted anything because I really didn't want to screw something up by coating it with some sort of adhesive or this, that, and the other thing. So you really had to think it through and then go ahead and fire away at your game plan. And first and foremost, I tried to use different epoxies to be able to hold it together. Had it all clamped and I waited for two days before I touched anything. And that didn't work. As soon as I loaded up that pressure, it exploded again. The next one was more epoxy after I cleaned everything a bit better and then also clamping it together permanently using metal brackets and screws and that didn't work either. Then I ended up trying to do that whole thing and then adding some fiberglass onto it and that didn't work either. So I was pretty much stuck because the big change that happened when I had that pump, I figured no matter what happens, as long as I'm floating, I'm always going to be able to create water. I've got all this food, so I should be okay. I have control over that situation. Suddenly, that control, that one mechanism that I had, that one up on Mother Nature, that I didn't need her to produce the water, I could do it myself, was now gone. And I remember thinking to myself, geez, okay, I looked at the chart and getting back to the closest land would have been Madagascar at that point. And it would have been a battle to get back there. Uh, probably would have taken a few weeks. The next little piece of land is a tiny little island called Amsterdam Island. Right smack in the middle of the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> and then further on is Australia. Now again, I think at that point I probably had about 20 gallons give or take and uh, that is absolutely way less water than you would want to have in that situation and and that being that far away from land so contacted a few people and they tried to get in touch with the little research team that lives on amsterdam island i mean we're talking a speck out there on the ocean and supposedly had i gone really close to it uh and and absolutely needed it i could have sailed up to them and then they would have brought jerry cans of water out to me and so that was sort of option a and then i figured okay well if i've got 20 gallons it's going to be another month or so before i get to uh, australia and i could easily probably pull in there and and you know have to stop the trip but i would at least be able to get water because that's obviously the main thing you want <laughs> is to live but in any event um the rain still didn't come and i every time i saw a squall off in the distance i had to fight the urge to try and sail directly over to it because you can never catch them they're all moving too fast uh but by christmas I was able to actually get one little blast of rain, which gave me just two or three gallons, which upped the ante of how much, uh, how much water I had. But slowly it kept dwindling and dwindling. And I'm consuming water every day, but I'm not taking any in. Now, some of the other cool stuff that was happening in the Indian Ocean. I have to interject here real quick. Every once in a while, on these long takes, this one take video, uh, it's easy for me to skip over some of what 
the story has to say, and this is actually a pretty important part. And I've done this before, actually, in my presentations where I've forgotten to talk about Cyclone Irving and the first knockdown. I don't know if it's something deep down in my brain that's trying to suppress that memory because it was so scary. But by the beginning of January, a tropical cyclone had been begun to develop and it made its curve down towards the south. And I had been in pretty calm, windless conditions for a while. But as this thing tracked, it started to track in my direction. And I had to make a decision whether to push forward and cross the T, which is essentially cutting in front of a hurricane or a cyclone, or turn back around, wait for a little bit until it passed, and then head out. Each way is a bit of a gamble, but I chose because I was running out of water and I was lonely and I was scared of the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean in particular, I pressed forward. And somehow in those light wind conditions, even with a rolling swell, with all every stitch of sail I had, I was able to push forward at really slow speeds day and night. And even when the forecast said zero wind, I had just enough to keep moving. But the night that Tropical Cyclone Irving ended up coming really close, I had thought I had outrun it and beaten past the edge of this, this storm. It was tightly packed, but inside near the eye wall, it was definitely hurricane strength. Only force one, but it was definitely a scary, scary situation. And the waves were, had been building up uh, throughout the day. And the winds were building up, but I was keeping more sail up than I normally would just to get as much distance from this storm as possible. And essentially, I got to a point where it seemed like things were sort of calming down or at least were steady. And I didn't really, I had been up for a long time and I really just needed to get some sleep. That was mistake number one. So I went down below. Hop in my bunk and uh, within just a few hours, somewhere around three in the morning, a huge rumble woke me up and then a smash against the boat. Kind of like if I had just been hit by a bus and it was essentially a large breaking wave. The entire boat flipped right onto its side, mast in the water. I was essentially hanging over the top of what I once was lying in and now it felt like the boat had turned all the way upside down but it hadn't it's just the fact that I have no horizon and I can't tell scurrying up to the cockpit trying to see if there's anything broken I was like man I don't know if we lost the mass I don't know what but slowly but surely Sparrow righted herself the sails are flapping like crazy and I get out into the cockpit move Mongo over so that we start running more with the wind, end up taking down the staysail. And uh, the only thing that actually broke was a preventer line to hold the boom so it didn't accidentally jive. But I didn't even notice. I was in such a sort of state of just being awakened and kind of panic and fear. And really the lesson that I took from that was that uh, sometimes you just really – if you've got a cyclone, if you've got a name storm or a big storm that's close by, even if you think that you've outrun it and you're in the safety zone, don't go to bed. Just don't. Stay up. Uh, it's worth it. You want to make sure you're in control and ready for some pretty bad stuff. And I took that on with me into the Indian Ocean. But that was definitely a very scary, very lucky night. And I'm just glad that uh, nothing really serious got broken in that night. So, continuing on, was that I was finding I started sailing through these massive, massive areas of red water, really bright, bright red, and it ended up being krill, and krill by the literally trillions. I had no idea there was so much of this. It, it looked, it was so thick at times, it looked like somebody had dumped a gallon of red paint into the water, and... Eventually, I started questioning, like, well, if all the krill are here, where are the whales? And whales kind of scare me a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I've heard too many sinking ship stories and whale crashes, and things are bigger than my boat. Uh, typically, are going to scare me a little bit when I don't know what they're up to. And within a day or two, I started seeing lots and lots of whales. Whales working in teams doing these big, big bubble cloud type things and all coming up and feeding from the same little area. It's really amazing stuff, but at the same time, it always gave me pause and made me a little nervous. And then there was one morning where I got like the shock of my life. I had just woken up early, had my 
coffee going, getting that prepped and ready, and hopped into the cockpit, and boosh, a huge cloud of stink and spray hits me, and it's a whale, and it's right there, literally just a couple of feet from Sparrow, and then all of a sudden, boom, another one from back behind, so now there's two whales, and from what I understand, these were finned whales, they're about 35 feet long, so just a bit bigger than Sparrow, and right up next to me and this is where i sort of realized holy cow okay the krill is that color red the bottom of my boat is that color red i could be in some trouble here i can't believe like the i mean these whales were coming so close right up alongside sparrow they turn on their side and then sit and wow. sort of swim right alongside wow. me tail getting wow. within just feet of my rudder of mongo the wind vane all that stuff and I'm just literally sitting in that cockpit shaking, just watching this all go down. And normally, a sighting like this might last just a minute or two. This went on for an hour, and they were swimming underneath the boat, acting more like dolphins than they were whales. I mean, they these things were absolutely huge, and they were just dancing around the hull of Sparrow. It was uh, an experience that I like to describe as amazing, terrifying, wonderful, and scary all at the same time. And I was able to get some good video of it, but for the most part, my hands were shaking so much that I uh, pretty much couldn't do anything. And so that was a pretty exciting, exciting day. And it was it was kind of nice to get that. I kind of consider it a little bit of a gift from Mother Nature because I was pretty down at this point. The bad weather systems coming in and out. The water situation was just getting worse and worse every day. And... Two, it was it was kind of foggy down there at a lot of times. Uh, as I started making my way further and further south into colder water, you know, if you got a northerly wind, the fog would kick in, and and so life just sort of seemed empty, and it sort of seemed I don't know. It seemed like uh, the loneliness had become really amplified, and I think part of that too was that I went through the holidays. So I had you know Christmas I spent in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the only celebration I had were a pack of gummy bears that I ate through in one day, which was very tasty. Um, but then I also celebrated my birthday there, too. And that's always a little lonely if you're by yourself somewhere way off in the planet. Uh, but I carried on. And as I went, I remember one day getting a little boost of rain. By this time, I was getting down into the single digits as far as gallons of water, and but I think part of me had just become so used to that fact that I didn't have very much, and I was really savoring every bit I had, that I sort of thought, well, okay, I don't have to pull into Perth or Fremantle, I can at least keep going, and then if things get really bad, maybe I'll stop in Tasmania. And so I started sort of, again, kind of in that same theme, I was shrinking down my scope and saying, well, I've got my exit there, and I can make it that far, uh, so if worse comes to worse, I can pull in there. And so I ended up doing the big dive, because I wanted to get a little bit of distance between me and the south coast of Australia. And so I ripped right back down into the Southern Ocean, right in the middle of the roaring 40s, and hook into a massive train of low-pressure systems. They weren't too bad, though. They were just about perfect for what I was trying to do. Enough wind to just blast us along, and one after another after another without pause in between. The waves definitely built up, but nothing too crazy. And uh, by... Just in February, we were able to cross underneath the third cape, which was, so I crossed under Australia's Cape Lewin on the western coast, that's the second cape, and then underneath Tasmania, which is the third of the five great southern capes. And into the South Tasman I went, and then off into the Pacific beyond. But we'll pick the story up there once we get there. But I think the Indian Ocean really was the point where all of a sudden my plans that I had sort of got thrown off to the side because things went wrong. And instead of flipping out and sort of just calling it quits, I, I sort of, I think I really was trying to summon up all the courage and summon up all the thinking of like how much work went into me getting to this point 
and all the money and the boat and just all the nights spent trying to sail that far away because, you know, we're over like 10,000 miles at this point. And that was what sort of helped goat me and keep me going, prodding me along. And, uh, you know, sometimes it takes that bit of self-motivation and that thinking and really just sitting down, almost meditating on it to continue on when you're in such an ugly sort of situation and things seem so bad, but you just have to keep plugging away. So thanks for watching. There's more to come. We'll keep pumping these out and uh, soon enough we'll be at Cape Horn and then rounding our way up. I can't wait. Next time.